Thank you very much for joining us. Just a very brief welcome to the Empire Center's second Governor UL Carey Policy Forum on a topic that obviously interests all of us keenly. Just a little bit of housekeeping and I'll give way to our, to our main speaker and then our panel. Um, our format today is, is pretty simple and uh, uh, fair, informal. Uh, Bill Hammond, our health policy director, is going to begin by presenting on uh, the subject uh, of the title of our event, which is Medicaid Migraine, and a talk about the, the uh, issue with Medicaid funding as it's developing now in the state budget. He will then uh, join and introduce uh, our distinguished panelists, and uh, each of whom will give their point of view on this, and he'll join in that discussion, and then there will be time for questions from the audience. Uh, another note for you, uh, we are going to have a video of this event online uploaded, we think by tomorrow afternoon or at the latest Friday morning. If you go to our website, empirecenter.org, we'll send you a follow-up email with that, I, I believe, and you can pass that around if you find it interesting and worth sharing. We've had some inquiries on that already. And so other than that, I would ask, uh, oh, the, the stock warning, just a reminder, if you have your cell phone, please silence it. And uh, with that, with, uh, I'll, I'll introduce somebody who literally needs no introduction, and that is our health policy director, Bill Hammond, who will begin with his presentation today. Bill. Thank you, and good morning. Um, it's, it's nice to see so many faces here, um, including our really excellent panelists. I'm looking forward to a good discussion. Um, I have to say, okay, so this headline appeared in, the, in Newsday on Sunday. Um, and I have to say, when I started working on this report, I really had no idea that this would be such a uh, topical um, subject. Um, I also happen to have listened to, maybe some of you heard about this interview that the governor gave to Alan Shartok yesterday. Um, I, I listened to it you know, on the web. I think I may have been the only person who wasn't listening to hear him say the N-word. Um, I wanted to hear what he had to say about Medicaid, which included the revelation that he does not fully understand the issue related to the delayed payments. So we're going to, hopefully at the end of this, we'll, we will understand it a little bit better. Um, I also, I guess I want to point to something in this story. It's reflected in the headline and also in the quote in the second paragraph, which says that the, the practice of pushing costs into the next fiscal year is simply managing the timing of Medicaid payments to ensure compliance with the global cap. And I guess I want to say right off the bat that this is by no means represents compliance with the global cap. This, this is, this is um, it's, it's a really interesting interpretation of the law, and it's, it's not consistent with what the governor himself said when he first introduced it. This is from his very first, um, when he did a slideshow, uh, when he did the budget presentation. February 1, 2011, he'd just taken office. Um, he was facing a, a very large $10 billion projected gap in his budget, a lot of which was related to Medicaid, a lot of which was related to the fact that um, federal funding that the state had received for Medicaid under the stimulus after the Great Recession, that that was going away. So that was partly kind of a unique circumstance. But he also, he talked about how there were these automatic trend factors built into the Medicaid law and that was driving a lot of spending. And so he said, we're going to, we're going to set gross and Medicaid to a fair and objective standard. We're going to, um, it's going to help us close this year's deficit, but it's also going to help us prevent deficits in the future and it's also going to constrain unsustainable spending. So the the plan that he proposed in which the legislature um, approved had sort of four interlocking components. Um, one was you would establish a rate at which you were going to allow Medicaid, the Medicaid budget to grow. Previously, you had these automatic trend factors that were kind of a floor for how much increase this was going to be 
a ceiling on the overall budget. They, they linked it up to the 10-year rolling average of medical inflation, which is like a, it's a benchmark that the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics puts out. It's been running about three or four percent lately. Um, then you would, you would bring in a bunch of stakeholders from the healthcare industry and, and some state officials and members of the legislature, and you would have a serious talk about how you were gonna meet that cap um, and you would try to find productive ways of saving money that would minimize the damage to um, the system and to the people receiving care. And to keep everybody honest, there was this transparency piece of it where you would, you would track actual spending on a monthly basis, compare it to what projected spending was supposed to be if you were gonna meet the cap, and you would report this out monthly. And then, uh, kind of the fourth piece, which uh, made the other three real, was this threat that you were going to em you're empowering the executive branch if spending exceeds the cap in the middle of a, a fiscal year, you're empowering them to take pretty draconian action to, to, to unilaterally to cut fees and reimbursements across the board or more or less across the board in a way that would keep spending low. And, and that has never been invoked. Um, it's an extraordinary um, level of authority that's never been invoked, but uh, I would argue that the threat of it was necessary to, to make the rest of it work, you know, to, 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 to get people at the, on the Medicaid redesign team to make real um, compromises uh, and ac accept real cost cutting. Um, there were a couple of caveats that I should bring up. One is that it, it didn't, it's called the global cap, but it didn't apply to all spending. It applied to the state share spending, roughly 40% of the total. Um, and in particular, it applied to Department of Health Medicaid spending. There will be a few acronyms today. Um, another, I think of it as mainstream Medicaid. It's, it's, um, people who qualify for Medicaid primarily because of their income. Um, what it doesn't include is the so-called mental hygiene, um, mental health, developmental disabilities, and substance abuse. That's not to say, well, uh, I don't want to get into the weeds too much on that, but <laughs> that's a relatively small part of Medicaid enrollment and Medicaid spending. Uh, and in fact, although the law doesn't require them to do this, the Cuomo administration has been paying some of mental hygiene under the cap for reasons I don't fully understand and, and the amount seems to change from year to year. Um, another big piece that it doesn't cover is federal aid. And so if federal aid grows, the state didn't have to worry about spending that extra money. That was not going to affect the cap. And in fact, this happened to be an era when federal aid was growing quite rapidly because of the Affordable Care Act. And then um, they decided to exempt certain defined costs from the cap calculation. Um, at, at first, it was a very small amount, um, administrative costs, uh, the, the takeover of local administrative costs was exempted. Um, this, these, these exemptions or loopholes got bigger, and there were more of them, and they got costlier over time. So there was this, this plan was greeted with a certain amount of skepticism in Albany because you were talking about a really fundamental change in how Medicaid was, was the Medicaid budget was put together. And also you were talking about a dramatic slowdown in the, in the spending patterns. Um, the legislature had in the past, in, in occasions of real fiscal crisis, had, had controlled Medicaid costs because they really had no choice. But you're talking about an ongoing restraint on Medicaid. And, um, and you know, as the governor correctly says, we had a history of, of double-digit increases. And so the idea that you were going to slow it down to 3 or 4% a year, it, it, was, it, was a cha it, was a, it was a steep hill to climb. Um, but also you were talking about moving a lot of the decision-making out of the legislature into, an, into this Medicaid redesign team, which was essentially an executive branch operation, you were, w which had certain virtues. It allowed for longer-term planning. 
Um, it, it's, it drained a lot of the political heat out of things. The, 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 uh, the ad wars that some of us who've been around for a while remember, um, they pretty much stopped. Um, and also, those fights over Medicaid were one reason that the budget was late so often. Um, and that, that meant that the health department couldn't really tackle the reforms that it got. It, it, it would fight really hard. It would get limited reforms, a, a fraction of what it wanted. They would be given permission for those reforms late in the fiscal year. And by the time they started implementing them, the, um, they'd be back in the budget battle again. And sometimes the legislature would roll back what they had done the previous year. So it, it was not, that was not a good system. And this promised to be very different. I know th there, there's a lot of skepticism about even um, after it was in operation and it seemed to be working, there was a lot of skepticism that they were fudging the numbers, and I think with good reason. But it's, the, the, the numbers, at least for the first few years, were um, pretty impressive, I think. The, <coughs> notice that the, the blue bars are the spending. They were basically flat. This is total spending, so it's, it includes stuff that the cap didn't cover. And they were basically flat for four years, and then there was kind of an uptick in the fifth year. But that reflects a, a, a huge run-up in enrollment with Obamacare. So over a million people joined the rolls in one year. Um, and so if you kind of calculate the, the growth in spending over those five years, it was about 17%. It was in spitting distance of medical inflation. Enrollment was up 31%. So this, this, is, this is a sign of a, of, a, of a system that's working relatively well. But over the next five years, the pattern changed very dramatically. Um, now it kind of flipped. Now it, it was enrollment that was pretty well flat. And it was spending that was going up at a, pr a good clip. Um, and the same, this, this resulted in kind of a mirror image on the uh, per recipient spending. So when the governor, we, we have a long history of spending a lot compared to other states. This is probably hard to read, so I'll read some of the numbers. Um, the red bar is, is New York's spending per recipient, and the blue bar is the national average. When the governor took office, we were over 11,000 per recipient, and the, and the national average was just over seven. So there was a, b a really big gap there. After a few years of rest the restraint on New York's Medicaid spending, we got that number down to 10. So it was still considerably higher than the national average, but the gap was closing. That's partly a function of the fact that the new enrollees, the people who are flooding in, were um, sort of generally healthier than the than the previous population. But still, this is, this is like a, a, a good trend for a state that has had trouble controlling Medicaid costs. And it, didn't, it wasn't accompanied with any, like the benefits were, if anything, were better. Um, certainly, they were covering more people. Uh, I'm sure people could point to things that uh, on the pro in the provider community could point to financial restraints. But it wasn't, it wasn't like our Medicaid system was functioning in, as well as it had been, more or less. So more recently, though, under the, the spending growth of this, the next five years, our per recipient spending really kind of went through the roof. It, it erased the, the progress of the previous years and reached a new high of, of $12,000. And this, it, uh, there's no sign that it's, it's slowing down. So, so why, why this change? The, the global cap was in, in, was in place throughout that period. What, what changed? Well, for one thing, it was kind of a structural issue with the cap. It didn't have an adjustment for enrollment. So if enrollment was going up, it was, going to be, it was always going to be kind of tight. And then when enrollment flattened off, it got a lot looser. Um, and in fact, you could argue that at that point, it starts being a license to spend rather than uh, a constraint. Because you have the 3 or 4% growth. and Programs often will grow to fill the available budget space, and, and so that's, that's what happened. Um, also, the early, the first few years, there was relatively low-hanging fruit in terms of cost-cutting to be done. 
Um, and those, a lot, some of those reforms worked really well and saved a lot of money. But then other, other things they tried to do that were more complicated and, and took more years either fell short or, or backfired. So um, that, was, that was one of the things that changed. Another was self-inflicted. They added loopholes. They, uh, when they froze the local share, so in New York State, kind of uniquely, um, we require counties in New York City to pay a substantial share of Medicaid costs. That used to, that used to be pegged to the total cost. Now, under Pataki, it was it was um, what was it the capped, and then uh, in after 2012, it was frozen, held absolutely flat. The, that created extra cost to the state. They exempted that from the global cap. And then maybe the biggest one of all was when they, when they um, did the minimum wage hike, um, which was a big one. It went from, was it $9 to $15? Um, they, um, they decided, they recognized that that was going to create costs for providers, which was going to create costs for Medicaid, and they decided to just carve that out completely from consideration in the cap. And I have to say that was a, a kind of a fateful decision because you're, you're um, like when you, when you carve out the, the, the local share, you're talking about moving money from one level of government to another. You're, you're not talking about growth in total cost. The minimum wage hike resulted in growth in total cost. And it, it's, it's labor costs. And labor costs are absolutely the dominant thing in healthcare. And so if you're not reflecting your labor costs in your, in your global cap, you're not really capping anything of significance. Another big issue which we'll talk about later is a, is a surge, an ongoing surge in long-term care enrollment and spending. Um, and then the final straw this past year was there were certain issues with enforcement and this past year was kind of a moment of truth for enforcing the global cap and, and the, um, it was not enforced. So what happened in 2019? Um, this, this, this shows the, the portion of Medicaid spending that is theoretically subject to the, to the global cap. It's the, this is DOH Medicaid spending. The blue part of it is the part where they've said it can't grow faster than medical inflation, and the red part of it is the loopholes. And they started quite small, and they got bigger and bigger. Last year, they reached a level of almost $2 billion, close to 10% of, of the part of the Medicaid budget that was supposed to be constrained by the global cap. And I, I guess when you get to the point where your loopholes are 10% of your total, the, the cap is becoming less and less relevant. But here's the thing, when they got to the end of the fiscal year, their actual spending was 1.7 billion higher than that. So they, and, and by the way, that didn't just materialize in March. That was, that was accumulating um, gradually. It, it first started kind of rearing its head in, in the summer and fall. And that was the moment when, according to the global cap statute, the, the uh, Department of Health Commissioner and the Budget Director shall um, create a Medicaid savings plan. That's what the law says. They shall get together and figure out a way to cut costs and keep things under the cap. Another thing, another, another thing that stopped happening was these monthly reports. I mean, they had periodically missed monthly reports in the past. There's probably a lot of work to do. They, they stopped altogether in... Um, November of last year, and so when the governor's budget came out and all through negotiations, the, there was no official record of, of where we stood with respect to the cap. So what they decided to do instead of cutting spending was this fateful decision to postpone um, $1.7 billion worth of payments from the end of March to the beginning of April. That moved the expense for, for bookkeeping purposes from, from the previous fiscal year to the current fiscal year. But, but none of this was, was reflected in the, in the budget negotiations. It wasn't reflected in the financial plan that the legislature passed. 
It wasn't disclosed to the public until, uh, I believe, um, May. And it didn't, it didn't become widely known until even later than that. Um, so I would argue that, that that was just a plain violation of the global cap law, that, that, that it was not being implemented. There, I mean, there's no, there's no penal clause in that. You know, this is like, <laughs> it, but, but it, it, it was not the way this was supposed to work. This is kind of a scorecard. Medical inflation from 16 to 19 was 7 percent. Enrollment was flat. Um, every index of spending, whether you look at just state share, total share, federal aid per, per recipient, it was all up two or three or four times the rate of inflation. So it's, it's hard to argue that the global cap is having really any constraining effect. Um, I, I mean, I think. I think it did, it did seem to be working for those five years. And as I talked about, it changed the dynamic of the planning process. And so I think there, it seemed like there was some value to it. It allowed for long-term planning. It allowed for, you know, people could think about year three and four down the road because, you know, they had a reasonable confidence about what their budget was going to look like. Um, and and the, the, the political dynamic was much less uh, acrimonious and... Um, but it, at this point, it doesn't seem like it's really uh, preventing us from uh, 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 preventing high rates of, of spending growth. I wanted to go back to the long-term care thing. This is overall enrollment was flat, but managed long-term care enrollment is anything but flat. It has quintupled since 2012. Now, some of that is a shift from from fee for service into long-term care, which is exactly what <coughs> state officials wanted. But I think towards the end of it. It's, it seemed to get away from them, and they're seeing unanticipated levels of growth, and it's continuing to go up. That last, that last bar is June. And a big piece of this is what's called personal care. This is non-medical um, non services provided in the homes of people who are disabled. Um, it's, a, it's a really important service for a lot of people. New York has, it's an optional benefit under Medicaid. Um, most states who do have it, there's 33 states who have it, and most of them treat it as kind of a limited program with caps on the number of people who can use it and caps on the spending and caps on the hours of service. New York treats it as an entitlement with no formal limits. So our spending, when the governor took office, was $3.2 billion, which was 23% of the national total. So we, in one state, was spending almost a quarter of the entire national spending on Medicaid spending on personal care. Um, this is what happened as of 2016. It had grown dramatically, um, and then now accounts for 40% of total spending on personal care by Medicaid. Um, I, I hope we're going to go into go into this piece of it um, more during our panel discussion. Um, that's what I wanted to say about the global cap. Um, I, we're going to take a, a few minute break before we start our panel. And uh, there's more details if, you, if you're really that curious. There's more details about this in my report, which is available outside. And thank you all for listening. So we're now going to move on to the second phase of our forum, which is a, a